Greetings to you conversationalists all across the fruited plain. If you are fortunate enough to be watching me on this videotape, then you must be a subscriber to my newsletter, The Limbaugh Letter. So first, let me thank you. Uh, you'll discover that The Limbaugh Letter is for people who think, people like you, people who are looking for the truth and who have the courage to face the truth. And you must be that kind of person, someone who examines the issues with your mind, not your emotions, a person who values thought, logic, and good old common sense. Now let me also assure you that you're in good company. As you may know, it's been scientifically proven by independent sources that the listeners to my radio show and the subscribers to my newsletter are more informed than the general public. You tend to vote more often and be more active in politics. You're better educated. You have higher incomes than the public at large. As a newsletter subscriber, you're among a million people who read my publication each month. From my picks from the most stupid quotes uttered by the liberal establishment to my conversations with top conservative thinkers, which is something I don't do on the radio program, to in-depth treatments of substantive issues from the Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. I welcome you as a reader. And now I welcome you as an observer. You're about to view firsthand a never before recorded event. You are about to get a personal look at the inner workings of the excellence in broadcasting network from high atop the EIB building. Welcome to Behind the Golden EIB Microphone. Kathleen, have you got a minute? I got this thing from Deborah Oren out of the paper today that says that Al Gore smokes a pack of cigarettes a day. We got a call. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We got a new paper, so. And it says it was compiled by Deborah Oren. Would you call uh. her? I can't, I cannot believe that he smokes a pack of cigarettes after everything that's happened, but if he does... Okay. Uh... Who else is on the panel? I wanted to call to confirm that Al Gore smokes a pack of cigarettes a day. That's what you reported in your column today in your post. yesterday that uh, talking about that quote of Hillary turn us loose and I got it. Huh? <laughs> Tremendous. Give me the date that she actually said this, if you can, because there's some confusion about that. Okay. And thanks. Way to go. The rest of them was program with your first name, please. Educators misspelled the word arithmetic on a fourth grade exam. Roll that call off. Students aren't being taught to spell anyway, so what difference does it make? Yeah. What is the question of comment for us, please? It was an editing error on the part of the Post. Really? Yeah. But Al Gore did smoke from 1968 to 1973. <clears throat> Sorry. So good. Al Gore has not had an ounce of tobacco since 1973. Do you measure tobacco in ounces? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> This is a special edition of the Rush Limbaugh program, America, the way it ought to be. Now, from our studios in New York City, here is Rush Limbaugh.
conversationalists all across the fruited plain. It's a Rush Limbaugh program coming to you from high atop the EIB building, where I am firmly ensconced behind the golden EIB microphone while sitting in the prestigious Attila the Hun chair of the Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. You know, it's really going bad. It is really going the wrong way when the Nobel people give the Nobel Prize for Economics to a guy who says the deficit isn't big enough. <laughs> it happened. It happened. There's a lot of stuff going on in the news. Can you, can you believe, my friends, that the, the Clinton campaign's all upset over this bozo remark? Yeah. Can, and how, how about the press is now saying, well, that's it. The civility lasted for a day and a half. Over a bozo remark, how about starving children? How about dirtying the water and air? How about killing people, Al Gore said? How about old folks never getting their medicine? So some guy in the audience is, hey, we got to get rid of the bozo. And Dole's, we'll get rid of the bozo. <laughs> he just repeated what the guy said, and they're all over it. Now, my friends, this is not, this is not the reaction of people who are confident with their lead. And you can reach us if you'd like to be on a program today, my friends, at 1 800 282 2882. This is Woody in Prescott, Arizona. You're next on the EIB Network. Hi. Howdy, Rush. Boeing 727 first officer dittos. Thanks for the call, sir. Hey, I got an idea. I was thinking, you know, about this bozo deal. And uh, it seemed to me that I wanted to see what you thought. If perhaps Dole just put out a, an apology, a retraction, perhaps even ask. Mr. Clinton to forgive him, say, you know, I really don't, didn't want the campaign to take this kind of a turn. Let's stick to the issues. I'm sorry for the comment. And uh, I just don't personally see how there could possibly be any negative spin on a, con on a comment like that. I think you could make a tremendous amount of hay with that. What do you think? <sighs> Man, Especially asking Bill Clinton to forgive him. Well, no, you don't do that. The apology, if that, but yeah. don't ask for forgiveness. Well, what I'm because saying by that is then you're kind of... Then you're, 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 you're elevating Bill Clinton to this lofty perch where he can grant forgiveness to people. Well. I, I, I forgive you. I forgive you. <laughs> I, I, I forgive Senator Dole. I think in the campaign we all say things that we, well, I never do, but others say things that they regret. Here's how you do it. You're on the right track, but this is why you're a caller and I'm the host. <laughs> what he should do is ask Clinton to pardon him <laughs> for this breach. Say he made a mistake, it shouldn't have happened, that he was caught up in a campaign appearance and he was simply responding to one of his excited supporters, but that that's no excuse. Mm -hmm. And that I would hope that uh, President Clinton would, in the limited time he has left as president, would pardon me for this tragic offense. That I would love to see. That I think would be awesome. Get the Dole campaign on the phone and tell them to ask Clinton for a pardon on a bozo remark. <laughs> One of the things that we have uh, been talking about for the past couple of weeks is Mrs. Clinton speaking at a Democratic National Committee fundraiser. Rich Bond wrote a column in New York Newsday, which first, actually Queens Newsday, uh, which brought this to our attention, where she said to a closed meeting of Democratic contributors, the, you got to reelect Bill Clinton because that's when Al Gore and I are going to be turned loose to do what we really want to do. We have the audio track of Mrs. Clinton actually saying this. And so you can now listen to it and judge for yourself whether she's serious or making a joke. Let her rip. I'm here to tell you that in the second term, Al and I are breaking out. And... Um... We are not going to let Bill Clinton and Tipper Gore have all the fun, but I'm not going to go any further. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but among the many reasons why you should vote and work for and contribute to Bill Clinton and Al Gore is to see what happens after the election when Al and I feel totally at ease to be our real selves. So Ooh, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, from May 8th of 1996, this year in Washington. That's Mrs. Clinton holding out hope. I, and look, I must tell you, you probably want to know what I think of it. And I will gladly tell you, although keep in mind, once I have my say, there's nothing else left to be said. 
Uh, fact is that whether she sounds like she's joking or not, she does indeed mean it. They're all looking forward to a second term where there is no re-election pressure, at least on the Clintons. A new Harris poll reported yesterday that a majority of voters wish President Clinton's health care reform plan had passed, and they hope he introduces it again. Same poll also says that more people trust Clinton over Dole to handle issues of health care and insurance. Now, this takes a cake, because my friends, this, this is just flat-out BS, Barbara Streisand. We were all there. We know what the American people thought of this health plan. They didn't like it. In fact, they didn't like it so much that there, it didn't pass in Congress. Believe me, if the American people had wanted this thing, those guys in Congress eager to give you everything you want would have passed it. And Bill Clinton lost the 1994 election. That was a Clinton referendum in 94. Clinton lost him for one reason, health care. And now this Harris bunch coming back and saying that the American people feel bad, they wish it would have passed, and they hope it's brought back up again? Man, they're pulling out all the stops. They're leaving nothing to chance in this election. Patricia in Philadelphia, hello, and welcome to the Rush Limbaugh program. I'm glad you called. Well, thank you, Rush. Mega ditto. What do people think uh, soccer moms talk about on the soccer field? Bill Clinton, aren't you intrigued by the fact that, according to the press, who apparently they think they're the most uh, enlightened and advanced among us, all think that women act alike and collectively? Yeah, that impresses me. Yeah, that impresses me about as much as a, a boil, you know? <laughs> um, it does not impress me at all. This is Mr. Snurdly, ladies and gentlemen. Bo Snurdly, this is uh, the call screening desk. And uh, this is where he determines who is fit to be on the program. Sometimes uh, people do slip past him, but most of the time does a standout stellar job. And uh, go, go ahead and let them see you. Uh, don't, don't let me get in the way here. There have only been one time I've had to suspend Mr. Snurdly when I saw him lose his temper with the caller. I have the suggestion that if he gets mad at a caller, he should simply just be polite and say, sorry, we're not talking about that. They didn't right. move on. But he got in a knockdown drag out, threw his headphones off, broke them. I saw him reacting here, uh, shouting what looked to me, I was over there on the other side of the glass, looked to be obscenities. And I found it necessary to suspend him for 45 minutes. Um, and it hasn't happened since, so it worked. This is uh, my trusty chief of staff, Kit Carson. And his job during the program is to archive it. He uh, actually takes notes about the content of the show so that if we have to go back and find something, we can. And he also handles every arrangement that is made with the press or with personal appearances or uh, virtually any other aspect of, uh, of my business day that does not involve the studio. This is John Booty. He is our broadcast engineer. He's sitting in this week for Mike Mamone, who is out on a micro-brewing vacation. <laughs> Isn't he? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> He's on the back porch testing his latest samples. And these people, uh, how do they get enough credit for what they do? Because the program yeah, wouldn't be what it is okay, without yeah. what they do. Uh, we're probably the most tightly screened talk show in America. We ask more questions of callers to determine who and why and what for. Uh, because the theory is that uh, a, a call here, if we're going to take a call, it has to be good. Just like if you play records, a record has to be good. Uh, you don't play anything but the top ten, or you try not to play anything but the top ten. Uh, there's no First Amendment on this show. I'm a benevolent dictator, and uh, you have to prove yourself. You have to prove to me that you're going to be inspiring, interesting, entertaining, or you're going to make me as host look good in order to get on the program. And we're event-driven. You have to talk about something in the news as opposed to a topic. You can't call and say, I want to say something about gun control. If gun control's not in the news, uh, Mr. Snurdly zaps them. They're gone. Show them how you zap somebody. That's it. Uh, if that happens, you're gone. See ya. They were never there in the first place. They're just those little blinking lights. They're nothing more than unviable electronic pulses until Mr. Snurdly gives them birth. <laughs> <laughs> Liberals look at conservatives as evil. So if you, if you and, and most of the press is liberal. But if, if by chance, Dole 
I'm sorry, Gore or Clinton were to refer to Dole as a bozo, there would not be the same reaction. There would be laughter. And, and they would applaud the courage of whoever said it. To understand it, you have to understand that all these stereotypes that liberals have crafted about liberals, they truly believe, and it's all under the umbrella of evil. Good versus evil. They're good, we're evil. Therefore, everything we do is evil, and everything they do is good. They can do no bad because they're good. They can say that Bob Dole wants to starve children. They can say that Republicans hold secret meetings for the express purpose of polluting the, dirty, the, the air and the water, make it dirtier, because they are good people. And that's the stuff that we've got to change. Much of what liberalism seeks to do borders on evil in the sense what it does to people. I think it's evil to turn somebody, a normal, healthy individual, into a dependent on government. It is evil to pit one group of citizens against another. It is evil to try to gain ground by scaring other people. The effects that liberals in power have on the society at large, and we got 40 years to look at it, that's evil. But we don't say that because we are concerned with participating legitimately in the arena of ideas. We are content to say, yep, yeah, we'll debate for the right to persuade the minds and hearts of the American people. We'll do that. We are content to legitimately pursue as many citizens as we can for the express purpose of persuading them that we're correct. Liberals don't want anything legitimate about it. Victory at any cost is what matters most. And so in addition to good versus evil, it's legitimate versus illegitimate. We don't have it in us to be evil. We don't have it in us to be mean. We don't have it in us to use the American people in order to get where we want to go. We don't have it in us to do anything but approach them as honestly and forthrightly as, as we can. But we'll be back after this break and conclude the program with more of your phone calls. Don't go away. You're listening to the EIB Network. That might be worth it, sir. I have a newspaper column here today from the, uh, from the New York Post. It's written by Kathy Bishop. She is a women's editor of the New York Post. It is yet another theory. Get this. The main reason women are flocking to Bill Clinton is that Dole reminds women of their strict dad who wouldn't let them do anything. He seems like the kind of father who sent you to bed without dinner, is this woman's opinion. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. This is not a thoughtful explanation. There's no way you can arrive at that opinion of Bob Dole having thought about anything. That has to be an emotional reaction to what Dole looks like, does it not? Now, if Dole looks like the kind of father who would send you to bed without dinner, what must Clinton look like? The kind of man who would take you to bed during dinner? Not even wait till after? Either one. I mean, but th this is my point. The arousal gap, ladies and gentlemen. There it is. We'll explore this in greater detail next time. See you then. And that's the end of the show. Another excursion into broadcast excellence in the can. Now, does this look like fun to you? Well, it is, folks, and this is hardly enough to satisfy you. You can get this and more every day, Monday through Friday, on the Excellence in Broadcasting Network on the radio. Look for us. We'll be looking for you.